I like this class very much. I like the people that are in it. I can see that God is using your lives and wants to use your lives in some really wonderful ways, in ways that are absolutely beyond us. And so that's extremely exciting. Uh, as pretty much everybody here would say, that they're just in love with the Word of God. Yeah. Amen. Okay, awesome. Uh, do you remember when you very first got attracted to the Word of God? Amen. Yeah. Remember mm -hmm. what that? Remember what that was like? It, and I'm talking about perhaps maybe before you even knew the Lord. Yeah. You had that yeah. kind of experience. Yeah. Uh, I had an experience like that. I was raised in a uh, very strong Catholic home. Uh, raised in uh, Catholic schools, parochial schools, for 12 years, uh, first through eighth. We were taught by Irish nuns, <laughs> and uh, they're tough. Yeah. They, they, uh, they wore black garb, even when it was really hot outside, you know, and, they, the habits. and the habits they had on, and they had these long black belts on the side of their uh, skirts. And I'm here to tell you that those belts were not just for show. <laughs> uh, back then, there was such a thing as discipline, you know. Yeah. And uh, that was first through eighth grade at St. John of God. And then uh, my high school was at St. John Bosco. That's where I graduated from. Um, a very devoted uh, family uh, to the Catholic faith. I still to this day, you know, we, as many times as we prayed the Our Father, I'll tell you, I, you love the Our Father? Amen. I love the Our Father. And uh, love singing it as well, brother. And uh, also uh, the Apostles' Creed. Awesome. All of the foundations are, were all there. They were all laid and strong. And I remembered I, I was an altar boy. And I remember the first time that I went to altar boy practice or whatever it was called, uh, for whatever reason, I was the first one to come into the church. There was nobody else there and it was dark. And if you can picture in your mind a Catholic church for whatever reason, they like those solid, uh, you know, cement or tile floors and the high vaulted ceilings. And uh, as, you wa as I was walking in there, all I could hear was my, you know, the sound of my shoes as I'm walking down the you know, d down the center aisle. And, and we were told to just walk right out onto the altar and just wait there for the priest to come out. And in the particular church that I went to, there was a very large, and I'm not, I'm not kidding when I say very large, a very large Bible uh, on the altar. The Bible was probably, you know, I don't know, two foot by four foot or bigger than that. You know, just, it was monstrous in size, you know. And uh, it had uh, very ornate uh, drawings on it. Uh, the priest would, uh, although it wasn't shown to the people, it was just there on the altar. They would open up to different places in the scriptures. And red letters, of course, were Jesus. There was a lot of gold leaf uh, design on that. And I remember walking up, and I was just kind of standing there, and I was just leaning over looking at it. And it was one of the parables that Jesus told. And, I remember just being mesmerized by reading the scripture and it being so exciting to me. And in the particular church that I went to, we didn't get a lot of scripture. There was a lot of uh, liturgy, which seems to be an intermediate step between the actual word and, you know, the actual people of God. But I remember being so excited just reading that. I was like, wow, look at this. And Jesus said, and that was thrilling to me to see that. And I remember when the other couple of altar boys came in and the priest came in, I got a little nervous, like, oh, I hope it's okay that I was looking at that Bible. You know? mm -hmm. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah. But I, I think that even at that particular moment, uh, the Word of God began to speak to me. And so when I actually heard the Word of God taught in simplicity, and in a very straightforward manner. There was something about it that was partial, partially it was so endearing to me. And there was another part of it where it was almost like a shock to me. And I remember it was Pastor Chuck Smith that I first heard teach like that. And as I sat there and listened to Chuck, that big smile on his face, you know, 
I was, uh, one of the thoughts I had was, he really believes this. He really believes what he's reading. You know, and it was kind of a shock to me to, to stop and to get that. But, but what happened was, it was like he had become that uh, proverbial salt to me. And, I, and, and my tongue was touched with salt, which makes you thirsty. thirsty. And so, so I wanted more and never had there, that time hasn't stopped. That was, I was in high school that, at that time. And of course, as I came back talking about Jesus, even in the school that I was in, of course, they all thought I was crazy, and I was inter interviewed by the principal, and they brought in some priests from another uh, parish to come interview me, you know. And, uh, a couple of nuns, I got to go uh, to, uh, back at, when the tent was there, I got a couple of nuns to go with me to the tent. Afterwards, uh, uh, the, the nuns that were at our parish, St. John of God, they were tough, but boy, could they sing. They sang like angels, you know? Mm -hmm. I used to think, how can they sing so beautiful and then be so mean to us? Because <laughs> 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 I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all of that to say is that when I spot people that have that same work of, upon them, that same spirit upon them, that I know God has worked in me, that lighting up, Oh, I just want to hear Jesus. I remember my dad telling me one time, he said, you know, Paul, I was thinking if I could go back in history to any time at all, the time that I would go back to is the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And he says, where they all sat there and they listened to Jesus speaking from that hillside, mm -hmm. where I could actually just hear him, you know, to, to, to hear the inflection in his voice. Mm -hmm. And so... I want to encourage you in your love and your devotion to and your intention in life to be lifelong students of the Word of God. We have those here, lifelong students. At no time will you ever come to this plateau where you have learned it all. At no time will you ever come to this point where you say, enough, okay, that just doesn't happen. Just get that out of your mind. Just understand in your heart and your soul that that initial bang or whatever it was where you said in your heart or received from the Holy Spirit, this is true, this is right, that never changes, that never dissipates. In fact, if you're getting taught clearly from the Word of God, all that does is grow. And so even before we get started, I have this great desire to look into your faces and just to tell you, God loves you. Amen. God loves you. It's like, it's like here you have the divine creator of the whole universe, and yet he cannot take his eyes off of you. You're his prize. He sent his son into this world to gather you together. He knows you completely. The, it's like... You know, I, I, I may have shared this with you last time, but I don't know. In my little brain, I think that at some point there was a council before creation, before angels, before anything. And there was this council between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in that council, Jesus looked down the halls of time that hadn't even happened yet. And the father says, I love that one, and I love that one, and I love that one. And Jesus says, Father, that one's ours, and that one's ours, and that one's ours. And the Holy Spirit said, and when they come to faith, I'll scoop them up, and I'll bring them along in this wonderful thing called sanctification. And, and look, <laughs> sanctification is like this one little you know what? Paul the Apostle saw heaven. He said it was so grand, so awesome. I, 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 I don't know what to tell you. It was so like, <laughs> there's no words. And, and then he said, look, even this present time, even the sufferings that you have that 
you know, real or imagined, <laughs> uh, whatever they may be, they're not worthy. They're not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. You see, you're going someplace. And it's a place that God has designed. And as he's taken his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit tapped you on the shoulder, said the word of God is true. His Holy Spirit has brought you into a place of life and wholeness. His Holy Spirit has guided you. His whole, you being here tonight, is that's no mistake. This is part of God's plan because he wants you to, again, hear that he loves you and hear that he has a plan for you. This is not just theology. This is our lives. This is our lives that the Holy Spirit will indeed in every single situation have an answer mm -hmm. and a direction and a plan. There's no part of your life that God didn't see and didn't know and didn't prepare for and hasn't given provision for. Mm -hmm. uh, come on! What kind of God do we serve? Isn't he awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Gee, well, you know... He's so great. And then he gives us his word and he gives us his spirit. And he says to us to walk in the spirit. And that's really where we're going to go tonight. Walk in the spirit. There's an aim that you have. And, and, and uh, look, look, it's an imperative. It's, it's a command, if you will. It's your commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus, what would you like me to do in the sanctification process? What, what is it that you want, Lord Jesus? Paul, walk in the Spirit. So if the goal is Christ likeness, if the goal is pleasing the Father, if the goal is sanctification, being set aside for the purposes of serving God, then I'm going to tell you, class, to walk in the Spirit is the only way that's going to happen. The Bible dramatically, the Bible pointedly gives to us the understanding that there's only two ways to live. Actually, there's only one way to live. <laughs> the other way is a counterfeit. Uh, but albeit a very popular way to go, nonetheless, it is a counterfeit, but to walk in the spirit or to walk in the flesh, that's it. And you're either doing one or the other at any given moment. And even as Christians, when we rededicate our, anybody ever rededicate their life? Of course. Come on. Uh, John 12, right? Uh, John 12, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, to your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you show what the will of God is. How many times do we read that? We go, okay, Lord. Oh, Lord, I dedicate myself to that. Okay, that dedication only lasts until your next choice. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and so we're continually. See, uh, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> if I might bring it just a little bit closer to home again for us, the whole idea of sanctification. It's not a scary thing. It's a delightful thing. It's something to embrace. It's a gift from God to you. Okay, how, see, see if you like this. I imagined one time that when I get to heaven... My hopes are that Jesus will want to take a walk with me. Mm -hmm. I would, boy, would I love that. And I imagine in this walk, Jesus putting his arm around me. Saying, hey, Paul, what do, you, what do you think about heaven? You're here. Just like he walked with Adam. Mm -hmm. I think it was kind of the same kind of deal. <coughs> yeah. uh, what do you think, Paul? Lord, you know, I don't know why I'm not melting on the spot. This place is awesome. Lord, you're so great. And, and Paul, it's only the beginning. I, listen, I have got it set up that from ages to ages to ages, I'm going to be revealing to you how much it is that I love you. Wow. Oh, Lord. 
But I imagined him also saying this. Hey, Paul, do you remember when you had to trust me? Remember when you had to trust me? But see, there I won't, I won't, I won't really have that, will I? I mean, I'm there, I'm glorified. I don't have the world, I don't have the flesh, I don't have the devil, I have Jesus Christ face to face. Mm -hmm. Remember when you had to trust me. See, we have been given something very special that in this particular little time and place, we can have a developed relationship with God that you'll not have any other time. Here it is, right now, that you're walking with Him by faith. That you're trusting him moment by moment. That you are walking with him by faith and by trust. It won't always be like that. Now abide these three. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Because when I'm there, I won't need hope anymore. Well, I have the hope of heaven. I have the hope of that walk with Jesus. But when I'm there, my hope will be realized. Mm. What about faith? Well, he's right there. I see him. I see the glassy sea. I, all these folks tossing their crowns. Oh, my gosh. What's left? Love. Mm. So right now, it's something really special between you and Jesus. Right now, in this time, it's, it's, it's about you and it's about God. You know, uh, there's these questions that arise about, in the, even in the sanctification process, well, who is it that does the work? Is it me or is it God? In, in this thing, is it all Him or is it on me? And even in walking in the faith, isn't it the Holy Spirit in me or through me or somehow doing this work? Didn't we just hear in the last session how the Apostle Paul said, Hey, I'm filling up the suffering that's lacking for the church. Somebody's got to suffer. Somebody, he said, I worked harder than the rest of them. You think Peter worked hard? Watch me. I worked a lot harder than Peter. <laughs> I worked harder than them all. Well, who was it then? Was it Paul or was it the Holy Spirit? And I'll tell you the truth. I've struggled with this for Anybody else struggle with that? <laughs> For a lot of years. And you know the thing that, that where the Lord has me right now as far as that's concerned? He says, it's all of me and it's all of you. We're in a relationship, Paul. Okay, let me give you an example of a marriage. Just suppose in my marriage, I say, well, who makes my marriage work? Is it all me, or is it all my beautiful wife that makes it work? Let's just suppose I said, it's all her. Oh, look at Frank Spector pointing at Jeannie. It's all her. <laughs> We're all thinking that. So just... You're all thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> Repent. No. <laughs> what would it be like if you had a marriage where it was all one person? Yeah. It's, it's unbearable. Oh, man. You know? So in my marriage relationship, it's all her and it's all me. And somehow, by God's grace, you know, strictly his grace, he, he allows the working of the Holy Spirit in us and through us and together with him. And that one verse sticks out that talks about uh, we are co-laborers. <laughs> with Christ, imagine that, you know. So let's do this. Let's pray really quick. Let's read Galatians 5, 16 through 23 and see how far we get. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here tonight. Because when it comes to teaching, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. You are the reveal of truth. No matter who's up here, if you're not revealing, it's not happening. So Holy Spirit, please be the teacher right now. Please help me to take the rest of the night off and you come and teach and reveal truth. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen.
Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, Paul the Apostle, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, notice capital S, the, your flesh against the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. They are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunken, drunkenness, and rivalries, and the like. It's like you say, here's the short list. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I'm here to tell you that these awesome verses draw a battle line for us. There is a war going on. There is a battle. And on one side of this battle is to be led by the Spirit of God. And the other side is the works of the flesh. And you're either doing one or the other at any given moment. Let's all remind ourselves of this crucial point. That the Apostle Paul here in these verses and in this letter is trying to get across to the Galatian believers and it is what the Holy Spirit I believe wants to get across to us tonight Galatians chapter 3 verses 2 and 3 Paul says to this church this only I want to learn from you did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh. You see, in the sanctification process, I hate to tell you, but your flesh may try to take over. Really? <laughs> and when that happens, <laughs> Failure is guaranteed. <laughs> you see, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It is the Holy Spirit of God that brings true repentance. You know, I worked with a fellow one time, and uh, he, used to, he used to love to get under my skin. I witnessed to him about Christ, and, and, uh, and uh, this guy said... Uh, Finally, he says to me, you, you have it a lot rougher than I do. Uh, you have to try to be good. Uh, all I have to do is go to confession. <laughs> Can you notice how either case would be wrong if he was right? Mm -hmm. Me trying to be good or him just going to confession, either one. <laughs> it's not a, would not be of the Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit that regenerates us. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us new life. We are those who are actually born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us to faith and to the following of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit calls us into acts of service and then gifts us and empowers us to complete the work that he has called us to do. Knowing this, the Apostle Paul says to this group of believers who started out great, and if you can hear it, he's actually pleading with this group of believers, can your flesh, 
can my flesh pick up where faith and the Spirit of God has begun? Will that now be our hope to carry through to full maturity in Christ? Well, we say, no, huh? That, 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 that can't happen. Yet we see a church today, and a church, I'm using a broad, broad stroke here. We see a church today very happy to bring in carnal or fleshly or human answers mm -hmm. to spiritual needs. The answer seems logical. The answer seems even simple. If God begins a work in our lives, it is God who will have to see the project through. Amen. Just like he says in Philippians 1.6, mm -hmm. he that has begun a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. That's your glorification. Look, I find it absolutely scary. I find it scary that it is entirely possible to start out right and to run your sanctification process right into the ground. That's what this church did. <clears throat> they started thinking somehow, oh, we need to get a program going. That'll do it. Oh, we need to watch how big business works. That'll do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need to bring in some psychology in here. That'll do it. Those are all the world's attempts. Those are all fleshly things. Paul's argument is that when we offer the vain attempts of our flesh, even with the sincerity of heart, <clears throat> without the Holy Spirit, we're not going anywhere. We are dead in the water. You started out your Christian walk with this utter and total dependency upon God, with this reality that came to you that said, I need Jesus. He's the only one. And then he kind of lifts that sin off of you. Remember that moment? Remember that time? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's never to change. Mm -hmm. That's never to change. In fact, I might tell you, it's to increase. I need him more now than ever. I just know that I do. <laughs> I know it. You know it? <laughs> We're those who know it. Look, this uh, kind of walking in the Spirit, this way of living was even spoken about in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, familiar passage to some of you, I'm sure. 31 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. That's on Mount Sinai. In that day, I took them by the hand and I led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Here it is. I will put my laws in their mind and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people this new covenant brought by Jesus which we can enjoy today is a covenant which is not dependent upon outward constraints to get me to act right it is not a law that is written upon tablets of stone but this is a law where God actually transcribes it onto your heart. How about this? He gives you a brand new hard drive. Amen. The other one's corrupt. It, 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 it can't get to God. It can't reach God. It tried to run on the law. We'll never make it. The law of God is no longer to be an external pressure which we live up to and to perform. Instead, it becomes an internal motivation. 
The way that we are to operate in the sanctification process is this is not a you have to. This is a you get to. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a you had better. But this is a desire of the heart that makes me want to. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you know, come on. When the Spirit of God is there, maybe it's in a place of worship or a place of prayer. <coughs> Or when God is moving by His Spirit through teaching or however that takes place, when you know, you know, you know God is there right with you. Isn't that well up within you? Lord, I want to. Oh, Lord, I desire to do your will. I want to be about the, oh, just it just pulls right out of you. And the best efforts of my flesh cannot produce this, nor will they ever. No program, no list that I commit to follow. It must be a work of the Spirit of God within me. Uh, take a look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Through the prophet, God says, I will give you a new heart. You know what I like about that? Sometimes we pray, Lord, heal my heart. Forget it. <laughs> Don't heal that old thing. Give me a brand new one. <laughs> I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> that cause you. Cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Look, before we knew Christ, weren't we just living for self? And who cares what God thought, right? Didn't we just like go for it? Didn't we just like, yeah. Okay, what happens then when you give your life to Christ? All of a sudden, those things that you had so much fun doing, all of a sudden, they're not so much fun anymore, are they? Maybe you went back and tried them, and you're like, oh, I feel horrible. I feel yucky. How did that happen? This used to be so great. Now I, I can't even look at myself in the mirror. This is, how does that, here's where it is right here. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that brings about this internal desire that I have now. Oh, I want to please my Lord. Oh, I, I, I want to bless him. He has blessed me. This is, this is weird. I was never like this before. But now God is causing something to happen within me. Not by the efforts of my flesh, but by God doing something within me. Verse 16 of, uh, where are we? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> Paul then, here's the command. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The walk in the Spirit means to take every step of your life by the working, leading, guiding, and empowering of the Holy Spirit. Think for a second. When Jesus was leaving, you know, as a we're thinking of uh, John chapters like 14, 15, 16, 17, even. Uh, Jesus is leaving and uh, imagine if you'd had Jesus with you for three years you know as John points out master of every situation you know he knew exactly what to do in every situation and watch him raise people from the dead watch him multiply loaves and fishes watch him tell the storm to shut up and it goes <laughs> I mean can you imagine being with Jesus for three years and then he says, I have to go? What would that do to you? Well, well, wait, well, wait a minute. What did you just say? And then he said a remarkable thing. Because if I don't go, the Spirit of God can't come. But if I go, I will send another. And the word that he used in the Greek for another is one that's just like him. 
not another of a different quality or kind or whatever. He says, I'm going to send you my very spirit. The very spirit of God is going to be with you. Now in that interim, what were the apostles like in that interim? Jesus gone, the Holy Spirit had not come. What were they like in that interim? Fearful, scared. Where were they? They were hiding. They were doubtful. They were locked in a room. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but what happened when the Spirit of God came? I, I think to myself, there was a certain sense within them. They were like, that maybe almost felt like, Jesus, you're back. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Jesus is back with us. We're going to see miracles. Things are going to happen. Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to do the same thing with you. Every day, every way. From the first moment you wake up to you say goodnight, even when you're sleeping, the Holy Spirit wants to be with you. That's the sanctification process. Uh, it's not business as usual for you guys anymore. This is being about your father's business. Look, uh, let me just tell you that the, the uh, Bible refers in many ways to walking. It's a big word in the New Testament, isn't it? Walk, walking. Romans chapter 13, verse 13, walk in purity. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk in faith. Ephesians 2, 10, Walk in good works. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3. Walk in humility. Walk in love. The book of Ephesians goes on to tell us to walk in light. Walk in wisdom. Uh, Third John tells us to walk in truth. Okay, let's just then think about the word walking. Walking means active. That's good. That's a great observation. Also, walking means I'm going somewhere. But I want you to notice as I go somewhere while I'm walking... I'm not only going someplace, I am. I'm leaving someplace. So see, there's a twofold thing happening as I'm sanctified, becoming more like Christ and more holy. I'm walking away from what am I walking away from? Walking away from the world and the old life and the used to be Paul. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, I'm not that person anymore. I don't live at that address anymore. I don't do those things anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. How do I walk in that new creation? I've got to be connected to the Spirit of God for every moment, every instance. Walk with me, Lord. And I've got to have a dependence upon Him. Look, the people that God healed, they were usually the noisy ones, weren't they? Yep. <laughs> you know, they were shouting out for Him. We should do the same. You know? I, I think sometimes we, even in our prayers I think maybe sometimes we're a little bit uh, we're a little bit uh, what would be a good word for it timid, oh, timid is passive. a good one passive is another good one yeah yeah well Jesus said you know if you could be with us that'd be nice and you know be sweet you're you know <coughs> amen it's like you the confidence. come on or confidence that's another big one huh Confidence that he's actually there and hearing and going to do and wants to do. Good one. We must walk in the Spirit, for it is the Spirit of God working in us to produce purity, good works, humility, love, who teaches us from his word. Look, please, don't you dare try to do anything in the flesh that God has started in the Spirit. Would you not do that? Just don't do that. It ends in failure. It ends in frustration. It just, it's not good. So Paul implores, verse 16 again, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay, here's the battlefield. That's the command. Okay, that's the command, walk in the spirit. And then here it is, verse 17, happening within everybody right here, right now. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Within every single believer, there is a conflict going on in the sanctification process. The leading of the Holy Spirit versus the leading of my own flesh. 
Now, when the Bible speaks of flesh, what's it talking about? Because flesh is another word that comes up a lot, especially in the New Testament. Flesh, it's not just speaking of the skin and the tissue. It's more than that. It's speaking of our fallen human heart. Our fallen human heart with its own desires, its own mind, its own will. And we are to understand that the leading of the spirit and the leading of the flesh are in total opposition. And since they are in total opposition, I need spiritual solutions. Always. I don't need fleshly solutions. If I have, look, you know, you, okay, watch this. You know where all your problems come from? All of your problems come from your flesh. Mm. All of them. Every problem you have comes from your flesh. Anger, hurt, whatever it is, lust, all those things come from your flesh. What's the solution to that? You see, I know they're there, I recognize them, and I need a power within my life that is greater than the demands of my flesh in order to lead a victorious Christian life. Hey, you know the flesh is strong, isn't it? Isn't the flesh strong? Well, I tell you, it's like, uh, it's like uh, you know, uh, you're, if, you're, if you're driving a, uh, a boat in uh, Australia and, uh, with John, and uh, <laughs> you, you're just, it's a beautiful day, and you're just driving along, you know, and right on, this is good. But let's just suppose that the way that that boat worked is it had an automatic pilot on it. So I'm just driving along, but if I take my hands off the wheel, whoosh, it goes off on this crazy automatic pilot. Uh, that's what the flesh is like for us. Either the Spirit of God is control, and I'm being obedient to the Spirit of God by the power that He gives me in order to be obedient to Him, or I let go of the wheel. And psh, I veer off every time, right? Is this what happens to us? So I need a power. The flesh is strong. The Spirit of God is stronger still. <laughs> Uh, look at the end of verse 17 says so that you do not do the things that you wish yeah if we were just going to like be really honest with each other tonight you know we are going to like tell the truth what a concept we would have to say that happens way more often than I wish it did and I say things Sometimes, have you ever had this one? This is crazy. This one's crazy. I think this is crazy. I mean, I'll be saying something, and I'll say to myself, why are you saying that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's not right. I know that's not from Jesus. Or you ever do this one where you, you do something or say something, then you go, you go, well, you know, they deserved it, or whatever the thing is. Then you go sit down by yourself. And then you think, oh, and then the Lord starts to talk to you. <laughs> and you go, yeah, Lord, I know. Man. Well, they'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord goes, no, I want you to go to go say something. I want you to go apologize, you know. Yeah. And so then you have to get up and you have to go over and and, uh, and I have to tell my wife, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> She always chuckles, you know. She says, uh, she says she loves it that. Well, the thing that she loves is that she she always tells me this, and yes, it is true, and it's true for her too. Uh, I, I, she goes, one of the reasons why I love you is because I know you love the Lord more than you love me, and because you love the Lord more than you love me, I'm safe. Because if you mess up, <laughs> then the Lord's going to direct you. <laughs> for the flesh lusts against the spirit the spirit does that break your heart here God puts his holy spirit within us and there's like this thing going on then inside you know 
where I feel torn sometimes. There is in every believer then this conflict, the leading of the Holy Spirit versus the leading of our own flesh. We cannot bring these human solutions. Uh, give me just a moment here to catch myself where I'm at. Oh, and look, we can come up with a thousand self-help answers to our problems, can't we? But the Bible only gives one answer. And that's walk in the Spirit. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Uh, okay, this one gave me heartache for a while. I had to like, I had to like go over this over and over again in my mind because I'm looking and I go, okay, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, but isn't the law good? And doesn't wouldn't the Spirit then lead me to, to follow the law? And maybe I should be looking at the law so I'll know. But this says I have something written in my heart that will lead me to do right. Okay, in this particular verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's talking about your flesh working to keep the law. Catch the difference. If you are being led by the Spirit, step by step, choice by choice in your life, you are not under some human, fleshly generated solution to your problem. Okay, catch this. Even the law of God, which is good, couldn't save anybody. Was it the law that was weak? Our flesh can't, just can't keep up with it. So you have this really good law, but look, if you look at the whole world and you say, if even the good law that came from a good God cannot keep our flesh in line, how can some fleshly solution thought up by somebody keep you in check? You know what I mean? It can't do it. So I have to then realize that I'm back in this place then of total dependency upon the Spirit of God, moment by moment, staying connected with the Spirit of God, not any outward constraint, but an inward desire that God has written upon my heart. Now, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from his leading and empowering, what does the old flesh produce? <laughs> Verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident. And then we have that long list. He starts out with sexual problems. But boy, does that speak to our culture and to the world today. Man, we're, we're nuts. We are crazy when it comes to sexual things. We're just, we are, we're nuts. Everything's got it in it. Everything, ever go see a movie and you start watching and you go, oh, why did they put that in there? Yeah. You know? Okay, for a while there, I thought we were safe with PG-13. I don't know if that don't think so anymore. I was like, you know, the key before was, okay, sweetheart, we have to decide here in our family. No more ours. Okay, there. It would just be G13. Oh, whoa, oh, okay, G13. Sometimes Jeannie, because Jeannie loves to go to the movies and out to dinner, right? That's a great thing we like to do. Huh? If it's a good one. If it's a good one. But she'll say to me sometimes, can we go to the movies? And I'll say, well, let me check. Then I'll have to go back to her and I'll say, sorry, babe. <laughs> it's, it's barren out there. Uh, the Bible will tell us what is true about us, as in these verses, and has been true about us since Adam and Eve. Catch this. We are fallen people living in a fallen world, and we need a Savior. So then he begins to list all these other things. Uh, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention. You know, I was listening, on this idolatry one, uh, I was listening to... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was John Corson. And uh, they took a trip, uh, I think it was to Egypt. And uh, they went into uh, one of the museums there. And uh, they were saying, oh, look, uh, here's a, a statue of what, what they think Molech looked like. And here's the uh, wooden idols that they uh, worshipped of Baal. And they were just going down the list. Uh, meanwhile, somebody had taken his little granddaughter, I think four or five years old, uh, to the restroom. She comes running back, and as she's running back, she goes, look, 
Idols! <laughs> Isn't that something? Here's, a here's all these adults and all these, you know, detailed explanations of that. She cut right through all of that. Idols. Sorcery. Hatred. Contentions. Jump. Outbursts of wrath. Well, we can do those pretty good, can't we? That guy that cuts you off on the freeway? <laughs> You ever wish somebody into the cornfield? <laughs> Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who, what's the word? Practice. Practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. To live by the flesh as your standard of operation, as your norm, as your routine, as your practice of life, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I expect that each one of us has fallen to these things, maybe more than once, huh? Yes. <coughs> but he's not talking about falling into sin. He's talking about picking a sin and trying to get better and better at it. <laughs> it's your practice. And the one who calls themselves Christian, but does not have a battle inside, is not experiencing warfare inside, has not taken the step to die to self and to live for Christ, that Christian needs to question their faith. Check and see, the Apostle Paul said. Make sure you're in the faith. And because of these things that are produced by the flesh, how can I have victory over them in the sanctification process? Can I do it by some religious activity? Some religious routine? By trying harder? <laughs> by the law? By psychology? The Bible says we are to walk in the Spirit. Look at verse 22. Here's the contrast. But the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, so uh, if I was, a, you know that announcer guy that comes up sometimes and he goes, oh, let's get ready to rumble. You know that guy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wish I could do that better. In this corner, we have the works of the flesh. <laughs> and in the other corner, we have the fruit of the Spirit. Even... <clears throat> The imagery that is given to us here is remarkable. Just bear with me. I'm almost done. I know we're a little bit late. Okay, catch this. The works of the flesh or the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> the works. The flesh factory. Where I try to poop out my goodness. Or the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> I mean, can't you just see the picture there? A picture of 19th century, you know, turn of the century, kind of a, 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 you know, factory with all the smoke billowing out of it and the sounds of clanking and all that. That's the flesh factory. So would you want the flesh factory or do you want the garden of fruit? And then he goes on to list, list those items. Let me pull up here and I'll, I'll finish up next week. Uh, in the start of the class, and then I also want to give you how to walk by the Spirit of God. And I, and I think you'll be blessed by that. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this great patient group, Lord, that's hung in there. I know we went a little bit long. And so, Father, my prayer for this group tonight, Lord, is that you would give them a sweet sleep tonight. That, uh, Father, you would guard their hearts and minds by your Spirit. That, Holy Spirit, you would bless them with a full, rich sleep tonight, Lord God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you being the teacher, that the wheat that was out here today, uh, that it would be planted and bring forth good fruit. And uh, any chaff, Lord, that happened to fly by, I pray, Holy Spirit, it would just keep right on flying. Bless this group. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Everybody says, Amen. 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 God bless.